All right. Well, if you're ready, um, our next speaker is Laszlo Peter from uh, Sun Microsystems, and uh, I just wanted to say very quickly that in initially this distro summit came out of uh, a couple of distro-specific summits. There was Debian and Open Solaris was actually the other one that ran very high, had a lot of uh, interest, and uh, we also had a number of Open Solaris contributions to this distro. Um, summit and some of them were too specific and some of them um, like Laszlo's actually I think are going to um, have a lot of value to this distro summit so um, I'm looking forward to what he's going to tell us about source juicer which I think ties in pretty well into what I said earlier about being able to automatically build packages so without further ado Laszlo is to you So, um, um, like the title says, this is about the uh, Open Solaris Contrib uh, build and review service. Um, and before people start leaving the room, uh, there is going to be a uh, connection with Linux distributions. And um, yeah, I hope it, there's going to be value in um, listening to this talk for Linux uh, users. So, um, I'm going to describe what. Um, source user is uh, go into more detail what the connection with Linux distributions is describe some of the features and I'm not a marketing person I'm not trying to uh, convert anyone to open Solaris or anything like that but I'm going to uh, share some of the uh, technologies behind source user that I think are quite neat and it's going to be demos um, uh, before I go any further has, has um, anyone in this room, used open Solaris before. Yeah, it's one, two, three, four, five. Oh, good. More than I thought. <laughs> Fine. And um, anyone um, used packages from the Contrib repository at all? No. Okay. Um, so, for the rest of you, uh, there's not a lot that you need to know about open Solaris for the purpose of this talk, but it's basically it. Uh, the roots are from Solaris. Uh, it has a um, pretty uh, decent GNU user land at this point, and uh, it's got a brand new package uh, management system, replacing the old System 5 release for SVR4 packages that Solaris uh, uses for uh, delivering uh, binaries. Um, and I might talk a little bit more about this later. So what is source user? Um, it, we started this project as a new build system for the uh, desktop um, components of uh, Open Solaris, uh, which is my team. I'm, I work in the desktop team, so we build GNOME and a bunch of other things that somehow get related to, to the work we were doing. Um, we wanted to replace the old build system we had with something new and cool and um, when the Open Solaris core team found out about our project they sort of hijacked it and um, wanted to use it for the, the uh, Contrib package repository which is uh, obviously it's a, the, uh, a package repository where users can contribute uh, packages and it was the first release um, on OpenSolaris.org was less than a year ago. Uh, since then, we have, um, I'd say, about uh, 350 tested packages in Contrib and a few thousand untested ones. And I'll get to that later. Um, it's a web service. It's uh, written in Python, uses a MySQL backend and Django. And the, the primary design goal was to make it very easy to uh, add packages in the system while um, trying to keep the quality at a reasonable level. So uh, the Linux connection is that it, it uses a build system that is based around RPM-like spec files. 
And when I say RPM like, it means uh, it looks like an RPM spec file, but it has some extra uh, tags in it that RPM doesn't have. Um, there are some RPM specific elements that we just ignore. But uh, in theory, it's possible to, to use um, RPM spec files in our system, and it's, it's possible to tailor our spec files to use them with RPM. And I'm going to have a demo of that later. And, um, so the, the roots of this is that we we had about uh, how many years? Six years ago, uh, Sun had a product called JDS, a Java Desktop System, which was a um, a Linux desktop based on um, um, SUSE Linux, and so it was an RPM-based system, and we needed some way to build the same. Uh, desktop packages on uh, Linux and on Solaris. So because uh, CC was based on RPM, uh, the obvious choice was to write a tool that can build uh, Solaris packages from uh, RPM spec files. So um, how does it work? Uh, anyone who registered on OpenSolaris.org just like to say uh, fill in your details kind of a registration so you have a username can um, submit an RPM like spec file and the, the minimum that we require is to submit a spec file and a license file and then um, that starts a review thread where anyone again anyone can view it and anyone within an account can uh, can add comments and uh, some contributors who have approval rights and uh, need to go in and validate it. So who are the people with approval rights? These are, in, in the open Solaris governance, they are called the core contributors. So people who have done a lot of work in, in a specific community group. Um, so the, these are not people who work for Sun. These can be anyone in the community. And we have quite a few uh, non-Sun approvals. Um, uh, the validation is basically just um, taking a quick look at the, uh, what's been submitted, make sure it's nothing you know, malicious, or um, that making sure that the license file that was submitted actually matches what, what the package is. And then um, it's a matter of clicking on the validate button. It goes into an automatic build system. Uh, which will try to build it, and if the build passes, then it gets automatically published in a uh, pending repo, which is kind of like a testing repository for um, for Contrib. Um, so those are all packages that have been submitted by someone, and they build successfully, but we don't know anything about them. We don't know how well they work. And then. Um, People can go and, and install packages from pending, and if it works for them, they can go and add comments or uh, tell other contributors. And those with approval rights uh, can vote for packages or against them if they find issues with them. And they are supposed to test the packages at least briefly before uh, they, they vote for a package. And if they get the, I think they need two votes for, for a package to be published into the Contrib repository for the general public. Yep? What happens if those votes don't get passed? But if there are too many, you know, too many packages and too little, you can just... Yeah, we have quite, like thousands of untested packages right now, but uh, the, there's another reason for that, and I'll get back to that later. But um, um, what happens is when people do care about a the package, they just go to the mailing list usually and say that uh, it is, I'm, I'm using this and it works great, and can someone yeah. uh, vote for it? Yeah, the the way around that is just to to you know grow the number of people who have approval rights, um, and that is you know, gradually happening. But you can still use the package even if it's not in the contrib repository, but. Uh, we expect a higher standard of uh, a quality standard for uh, the contrib packages. Uh, the build environment. Um, the packages are all built in, in their own 
kind of like virtual build machines. These are open slurs zones. Uh, a zone, uh, as you can think of a zone uh, like a, a change route environment, except it's a bit more. Uh, it's got you know, its own network stack and, and other things, but for the purpose of this uh, talk, you can think of it as a, as, uh, a change route uh, environment. Uh, um, the spec file has to specify the download location, which has to be the upstream. Um, all the dependencies and the, obviously the, the build and packaging uh, of the component. Um, the build environment that is uh, the package is going to be built in is completely minimal. It's just just whatever is absolutely necessary to to boot the zone and some build tools that everyone needs, like the compiler. So the packages must declare all of their build time dependencies. And they, uh, I think this is quite important and, and probably useful for Linux distributions as well because you probably have the same problems. Uh, what we are trying to solve here was that um, if you use, if your package uses like autoconf, it will, when you run configure, it will just pick up the dependencies on the system and depending on what you have installed on the system, it will change the, uh, change the binaries. So it will change the features of your, your binary package. And we don't want that, obviously. We want our packages to be consistent. Um, what happens is uh, if, if you have a, a full system that, that you use for building, then uh, you might have an additional package added, and then uh, your package gets built. Uh, it will pick up, configure will pick up the new dependency, uh, changes your package, um, and you may not even have the dependency in the spec file, so it, the, the dependency may be uh, missing from the binary package, so it all gets messy. So um, to avoid that, and, and the other thing, sorry, is just to, you can get into a situation where you have like circular dependencies in packages and you won't even notice because uh, you have everything installed. So uh, we decided to use a minimal build environment and just install everything that the package claims to depend on, nothing else. Um, so the, uh, yeah, these are some of the uh, neat things that we use uh, for the build. Um, zones are uh, on, on ZFS are, are really cool because um, um, ZFS has this feature of um, taking snapshots of a, a file system and cloning it and, and rolling back to a previous snapshot. So we can create basically a new uh, build system in a matter of seconds just by, we, we set up a, 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 what we call a template zone, which is this minimal build environment. And then when we need to build something, we just say clone this template and it, it's almost instant. Um, the zones have their own uh, network stacks, so uh, in, in the case, or can have their own network stacks. In, in this case, we just disable all networking in a zone to, to make it more secure. So all the uh, network operations, like downloading the, the uh, sources or installing the dependent packages from the package repository are done in the global zone. So um, like the global zone is like the, the, uh, the metal itself, basically. So we you download there and copy the files into the uh, the build zone, and then um, you can log into to this build zone, run the build, and uh, if the build passes, we run some extra sanity checks, and then it gets published. The package gets gets published in a repository that lives inside that zone without any network connection, and then we go back to to the metal and republish it to the pending repo. And then the, at the end of, uh, of the build, we can either throw away this build zone or just roll back to uh, a snapshot, which is, I think, the, the solution that we chose. So instead of us, basically, it does a copy and write mechanism. When you take a snapshot, it will start copying files that that you change, and at the end of the day, when you, when you finish with the build, you can just say, forget all that. 
Um, so um, one of the questions I, I get from, especially from uh, Solaris people who uh, often dislike this uh, method of building from spec files, why, why did we choose spec files? Um, uh, so I already mentioned that we have the, uh, this Linux-based product called um, Java Desktop System, which had nothing to do with Java, it was just a marketing name. But it was based on, on, um, on SUSE Linux, so it was built from spec files, and we needed uh, some way to do the same. So we had uh, a tool called Package Build that built that behaved exactly like RPM Build, taking the the um, spec file and uh, doing exactly the same steps, but at the end uh, it created a Solaris package. Um, so. Uh, we had this tool already, and it worked well for the desktop team for the past six years. Um, it had to be modified to support the new um, packaging system in Open Solaris. Um, uh, th there's been a, a community of um, people who write spec files growing since package build was released, and people uh, outside of Sun who just um, needed something packaged up and they wrote a the spec file because it was easier. They could just take the spec file from Linux, tailor it, build it, and they uh, share the spec files in a um, repository on SourceForge. It's called uh, Spec Files Extra. Um, so we had quite a few of those, and we thought it would be a good idea to reuse those spec files for the uh, contrib packages. And also, um, there are so many people who know how to write spec files and how to work with, with spec files and RPM, so it, it was a good idea to, to uh, um, reuse that rather than you know, uh, do something different that they need to learn. And of course there's um, uh, the cooperation with RPM, these Linux dishes, which I th personally think is very important. Uh, I in the past, I know I took spec files from like Fedora and uh, just wrapped them up in, into Solaris spec files, and, and um, we are probably still shipping some of those in, in um, Solaris and Open Solaris, and it's very easy to do and, and saves a lot of time and you know uh, reinventing the wheel. Uh, so, how are these spec files different from RPM spec files? Um, they, there are some extra uh, elements in the spec files, extra tags uh, mostly that uh, add additional uh, information to, to the spec files that, that is needed for our packaging mechanism. And there are some elements of RPM that we don't implement. And, uh, that's sad, but it's just um, 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 basically just because of time constraints, not because of a decision. Um, and some of them are just uh, elements that, that just don't map to anything in, in uh, Solaris. Um, the, this is an, another kind of cool thing, um, is that we can um, have hierarchical spec files. I'll show you examples of that in the demos. Uh, we can basically wrap a um, Linux spec file in a Solaris spec file and, um, uh, without repeating everything that is in the Linux spec file, you can say you just do say the prep section of the Linux spec file. Um, so the the Solaris spec file basically just adds the um, Solaris specific bits, uh, packaging, package names, dependency names um, that are different, and we can leave the, the Linux spec file unchanged. And uh, another reason why this is uh, oops, what's happening? Uh, another reason why this is uh, often useful is when we need to, um, say, build the same code, 32-bit uh, and 64-bit on Solaris. They're all usually packaged together because you can run 32-bit um, uh, or 64-bit on the same kernel. So um, um, when you do the same thing twice with different compiler flags, we don't have to repeat everything. You just say. Uh, now I'm changing the flags and to redo this. Um, not sure what's going on here. Oh, the demo. Um, hmm? Yeah. <laughs> the 
yummy, aren't they? Uh, so, um, yeah, I wanted to first show you how uh, uh, source user looks like. So this is um, just the the um, main page. Um, Um, so the, this is where users can submit batches. They even uh, give it a name, just some, something to identify it. Um, they need to upload at least one spec file and one copyright file. And they can add the additional files, uh, patches, uh, man pages, um, other sources as like if you if you want to add a file that is not part of the, you don't want to patch it and you don't want to um, um, yeah basically you don't want to patch it and it's not part of the source table um, it's like the, it's for for use with the source tag in RPM um, we've got some other stuff, the base spec is what I call, I call the Linux spec previously which is like something that you refer to from the main spec and you can include files from package build spec files. Um, uh, when you submit it, it uh, goes for, for review and we have a number of uh, packages here. Uh, so the they ones with the X haven't been validated yet. The ones with a tick have been. Um, let's look at one of these. Um, so this guy uh, uploaded a spec file, which looks very much like an, an RPM spec file, except it has a few extra things, like includes Solaris link. It sets up a few um, like compi compiler flags and. Things like that, and we have some special tags that you don't have in uh, RPM. Um, some meta information for our packaging system. Otherwise, it looks exactly like an RPM spec file. Um, this, yeah. Uh, so this is the, the validation part, where I'm supposed to check that the copyright file uh, looks reasonable and spec file looks reasonable and check the, the community side um, and if it all looks right I just click on validate which I'm not going to do now so I haven't done these steps or you can add uh, comments uh, and here's one that has been validated Yeah, not much activity. Basically, the submitter um, resubmitted the, the the spec file. Um, I wonder if I can find anything. I, and there's nothing that has votes here because they usually get into country pretty quickly. Uh, if I go to the builds page, this is where everything that has been validated will ultimately go um, and get built. Um, Yet someone was experimenting with this spec file quite a bit. Uh, you can click on the log to find out what happened. Oh, the, this, the preparation is just uh, setting up the zone, what dependencies were specified in the spec file and, and, and what, uh, how they translate to IPS packages and what got in, installed in the zone. And then uh, the package build log looks like an RPM log except in, in this log it's prefixed with package build but it, it looks exactly like a, an RPM log and then we get some compile failures and here's one that passed yeah that's not what I wanted to show you actually um, if, if it passed you can click on the install link and it will open in the package manager and you can install it with uh, for testing and then because this passed the build you can sorry go to oh. I wonder why it doesn't have a link but I show you another one so this one passed and it has a link to the uh, review page 
And if I go back to the review page now, I can, there's a new tab here that says vote. I can add comments and then vote plus one and minus one based on what I found when I tested it. And then um, my user is just a collection of things I, I uh, submitted or commented on. And for my own submissions, uh, I can always um, go back and change things. I can change the identifier, delete files, uh, completely withdraw my submission, or I can resubmit uh, files. Uh, yeah, so that's what it does uh, currently. Um, what I wanted to show you is uh, how some of our actually didn't check it as visible. Uh, yeah, so I was looking at my screen, and I'm not sure if you saw everything on, on this screen when I was showing it, because half of the screen is missing. But hopefully, you did. Um, Okay, so I wanted to show you a few uh, spec files that uh, we use. This is not actually in the contrib repository, it's, um, it's in the desktop. Um, the, these open Solaris desktop, where we also use the same um, uh, mechanism. So it also, it looks like a normal uh, RPM spec file with you know all the different uh, sections and change log and everything, uh, except it, uh, it, it adds, um, no, actually, this is the base spec. So this is the, the uh, Linux-like uh, spec file that we can wrap in a Solaris spec file, and I'll show you how. The corresponding uh, main spec file, Sun WGDK didn't do that spec, uh, has uh, things like this here, uh, use GDK equals gdk do that spec, it assigns a label to the, the Linux spec file, and then you can refer to sections of the, the um, Linux spec file, like gdk do that version, which is the value of version in that spec file. Or um, it adds, uh, yeah, these ugly um, Solaris uh, specific package dependencies. And they, uh, If you look at the build section, you can do things like uh, gdk 2build and I, this minus D tells it to run it in a subdirectory. And in this case, this is done because um, we're building GTK twice, one in 32 bits and one in 62 bits, so we are assigning another label to the same spec file. But before we do that, we uh, change the flags slightly uh, in these include files, and then uh, we just run the same uh, sections from the GTK2 that spec, spec file twice. Um, the, the patches, we, uh, uh, this goes back to, to Martin's talk. Uh, we have um, in, in all the desktop uh, patches, uh, all the desktop spec files that we have, we have some metadata for all the uh, the uh, spec files, uh, well, although every single uh, patch, sorry, um, who wrote it, when, well, this is before we started doing this, so that's why it's got an invalid date, but uh, what type of patch, and we have uh, feature patches, uh, bug fixes, and boxes, bug fixes must have um, some sort of uh, bug ID associated with them. Um, um, I don't see any example of that here, but we also have uh, branding. Yeah, here's one. Uh, branding patches, which is what you call the um, uh, distro specific patches. Um, um, to reduce the number, of, we, like GDK is, uh, has uh, yeah 14 patches, um, but to reduce the number of patches, we normally require every single patch to be submitted upstream if it makes sense. Uh, meaning if it's, you know, a branding change, obviously it doesn't make sense to, to submit it upstream. And um, 
some of the features we have don't make sense to, to submit upstream if they're too specific to Solaris. But otherwise, every uh, bug fix uh, has to be submitted, and that, that's why they, they have to have a, uh, a bug ID associated with them. Uh, in this case, a Bugzilla GNOME org bug ID. Um, okay, another thing I wanted to show is um, um, I uh, just how how uh, I can reuse spec files from um, Linux distributions and then the reverse as well. Um, I downloaded just um, well actually uh, I have to admit that it took me a while to find a package that just built out of the box uh, to just taking the spec file that didn't use anything uh, that, that um, was, wasn't was too specific to say Fedora or it didn't use any uh, or Susie I think in this case or it didn't use any um, uh, macros in the spec files that, that we didn't have or didn't define in our uh, implementation so um, I found the efax it was quite uh, a simple package um, yeah I think I downloaded this from um, from Suzy um, it, it's a source RPM like it's got two patches a spec file and the source tarball um, um, yeah, the only th of a couple of things I needed to add. Oh, I better load it here. Right. So a couple of things I needed to add was um, that the dependence, the names of the dependencies are different. We have all our package names currently are, or most of them are prefixed with some W that's actually changing. It's going to uh, be different with IPS, but they, we still have the old package names, so I needed to change that. Um, if I make this change, um, with, with this, um, if it was um, constructed, I can make the changes so that the, the spec file can still be built on uh, Fedora without um, having to take out anything, but it will also build on, on Open Solaris. Um, yeah, that, that's the, the only other thing I need to add is just a, a, a copyright file because we require a copyright file uh, for our packaging system. Every uh, package has um, a separate file. So, like normally in RPM, you would have just an indication of the license. And in our packaging system, we actually require the full license text. And then um, I can just say package build minus BA efax spec, and hopefully it will build. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually just uh, this is not using source juice, so it's just package build, which is the engine behind. I can, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, that's actually that's a good point. I can um, uh, try to submit it, and I haven't done this at home, you know, to test. So hopefully it will work. Mm. And as uh, somebody mentioned before, it's more difficult uh, in big corporations for em employees to, to contribute than it is for um, external people. Uh, that's true. I'm, I'm actually uh, n not uh, supposed to, uh, some employees are not supposed to upload anything that, that hasn't been uh, legally reviewed. So, um, yeah, that's it. Wrong spec file naming convention. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, to keep uh, 
keep it sort of uh, nice and clean. We, we uh, enforce a naming convention for uh, batches. Uh, uh, you probably don't see the end of it. Um, uh, the, the naming convention is that it, it has the up upstream name, like EFAX, so that, that's fine. But then it, we've got a two-digit number which specify the order of uh, in, uh, adding the packages, uh, the patches, sorry. And then uh, like a one-word uh, uh, description and then dot .diff. So um, uh, we'd have to rename these patches. So you like if I zero one does there dot diff and zero two I'll defined dot diff. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh Just one one try, and if it doesn't work, I'll just give up. I, like I said, I haven't uh, tried this at home. So. so it's now doing some cursory checks on the, on what I submitted. Like, like okay, so it was successful. Uh, it opened a uh, review thread. Um, um, because I have rights, I can actually validate it for myself, but I'm just set you know, to uh, leave it for now. And it will be built, I can install it, and you have to believe me that it works. So any, any questions? I don't have much time left. No? I have a question. Okay. Um, so can you run this locally on your machine, or are you always bound to use this? Juicer.opensolaris.org. What's so, the license? Uh, I, I, I can actually, um, well, we can run um, um, package build locally, and you could create a zone uh, locally. Uh, uh, and that's a good point. I, we don't provide anything that, that but it's easy to set up, but we don't actually provide any um, help with, with doing that. But without that, you can still, you know, just run package build locally. See if you're, and that's what people usually do. Uh, just uh, see if it builds. Uh, if it if it does on your system, you upload it and it'll get built for you. Okay. And what is the license on the source juicer? So, um, yeah, again, it's um, uh, one of the um, problems at big corporations. It's uh, we we. Uh, always wanted this to be open source and it's, it is going to be released but the only uh, problem is that there, there are a number of steps we need to go through uh, before it can be released but it will be released uh, because there, there is actually um, interest from um, uh, I think like there, there was someone from a university who wanted to use this to build their own packages uh, so yeah, it's in the process of being released, and I assume that uh, uh, because it, it's part of the Open Solaris project, it will be the Cuddle or CDDL license. And how um, how easy is it going to be for someone to swap out all of the um, internals? Like, say, I want to use all of this, the entire workflow, but actually not have package build in the background and not have zones, but have Strut and Deb making devices. Is it trivial to do? Is it modular? No, I'd or? say it would be pretty, pretty difficult to do. Pretty uh, difficult to yeah. do. All right. So uh, the, the whole idea is very much, um, you know, uh, based on, um, you know, using the zones and, and, um, and using spec files. Yeah, so it keeps calling uh, package build for, for a lot of things, for uh, extracting information from spec files, et cetera. Okay, but the main idea is there. That's good. Um, cool. Any questions? Any other questions? No? Then I suppose we can wrap this up and you guys can head a, have a head start into the tea break and be first in line for the coffee and all of that. Um, we reconvene here at a quarter to four, if I'm correctly informed. So uh, please be here on time if you're interested in the next session, which will be Dustin talking to us about Launchpad.